trout are rising under the mayfly, and the sun is shining down on the valley. Hope to be a fly fish till the day that I die. Spring has thawed out the long bitter winter. The water is clear and the skies are blue. I'm standing in the middle of the Beaver Kill River. I might even catch and release one or two. Size 22, size 22 trico. I'm going to use black thread. I'm going to tie that on the hook. I'm going to make a loop here and bring the extra thread up over the hook. Pinch that and wrap it. I take my microfibers, just a few of those. You don't need a lot, it's a tiny fly. Size 22, we're going to measure that, trim it, and tie that on. You're going to pinch and then hold and pull up to tighten it. If you pull down to tighten it, it will wrap around the hook and you don't want that. You want that material to stay right on top. Now we're going to try, this is a tricky part, we're going to try to divide that that wing material, pull it forward, pull that thread forward and then wrap this around that. So we get a fairly nice split tail effect right there, see that?
we're going to wrap that thread up for the body up to where we're going to start the wings the wing material is pretty simple it's just a very small amount of poly uh, compare post material and I use white my scissors aren't cutting very good today and I'm going to pinch that and wrap that around tie it on there good and tight right about at the shoulder of the hook and then I'm going to try to split this with my scissors into two bunches okay two bunches that are equal and I'm going to tie one off on one side with the figure eights I'm going to tie the other off on the other side so that they come straight out okay it's like a rusty spinner only black and much much smaller okay there's our wings now we're going to take a very small amount of black dubbing and we're just going to use little little parts of that we're just going to dub that on there spin that right around the thread nothing unusual about that maybe a little more we want this thorax to look nice if you actually look at the trico he's uh, got a beefy beefy thorax we're gonna wrap this around those wings in a figure eight pattern if we can and wrap up to the eye and you can do a whip finish you can do a half hitch whatever you want to do and I typically will put a little bit of super glue right on that that dubbing or on that thread not the dubbing I'm gonna pull my wings straight up and I'm gonna nip them off right about the length of the shank and they're gonna stick out sideways like that there you go your trico is done Hey folks, welcome to Ruffles and Waves today. Uh, you just saw me tie a 
tiny trico fly, which is a uh, pretty cool little bug. Uh, they hatch at night, and they mate at night, and then they die after they mate, and they're floating down the stream, okay? And they're, they're, their wings are sticking straight out because they are no longer alive. They are now food for the trout. So when you fish a trico, it's usually in the morning, and um, it's a trico spinner. It's a, it means a spent wing, you know, configuration. The wings are straight out, and as you saw in the in the video there, um, the trichos are pretty small. They're usually from 18 down to 22, 24s, um, and uh, you really can't see them out there. You cast out there, and you just are guessing where your fly might be, and if you see a ripple there, you tighten the line. It's it's pretty much uh, uh, guessing. Uh, where your fly is because it's very hard to see them. But they do feed pretty heavy on trichos. I've seen big hatches uh, up on the Alsable um, of midges and, and trichos floating down. Um, I've also seen uh, seen it on the west branch of the Delaware, Hale Eddy, sometimes in, in the summertime like uh, late July, early August, there'll be a good trico hatch early in the morning. And if you're out there eight, nine o'clock in the morning, uh, you'll catch some nice fish using a size 20 trico. Now, uh, again, they are small. You need a magnifier like this to tie them, at least I do. And uh, that's pretty much uh, uh, all I need to say about a trico. They're a spent wing, and there's no reason to try uh, tie a trico dry fly. I mean, there's just no reason to. I also want to remind you about the Ale Hazard Chapter Banquet uh, uh, coming up on uh, March 26th. Uh, it's at the Shriners again, and uh, you can email me if you want more information about that at avkurt@mac.com, and I'll be happy to forward you a poster of the of the event. Um, the ticket prices are on there, and, and I'll give you all that information. But that's the Ale Hazard Chapter Banquet. Now we need help getting prizes and donations. If you're a business and you like this show and you want to support Trout Unlimited, uh, contact me and I'll let you know how you can get a tax deductible donation made. Uh, we also have raffles and prizes going on. We have grand prize drawing. Uh, tickets are five dollars a piece, uh, three for ten dollars or something like seven for twenty dollars. So if you want to get tickets for the grand prize drawing, grand prize drawing is usually about fifteen hundred dollars at camping gear. Uh, canoe, tent, coolers, everything you need but ice, food, and uh, a place to go, okay? So uh, keep that in mind. So give me an email. New York City has the world's largest unfiltered water supply. Right now, the natural gas industry wants to drill in our watersheds. The process is called hydraulic fracturing. It uses over 900 chemicals injected under the ground combined with explosives that cause many earthquakes to extract the gas. But the process hasn't been proven safe. Watersheds across the nation have been contaminated with plastics, carcinogens, mutagens, and endocrine-disrupting chemicals, and with explosive natural gas. Whoa. This cannot be allowed to happen here. Join Scott Stringer, Manhattan Borough President's Kill the Drill campaign, because we can't drink natural gas, and because there's no New York without New York water. And that, to me, is the most alarming environmental news I've heard in a long time and makes this the number one environmental crisis that we face in the city. A message from Scott Stringer, Manhattan Borough President, and WaterUnderAttack.com. I like the idea that this particular activity is isolated from the Federal Clean Water Act when every other activity is still under the restrictions 
and observations of federal clean water. Act. So to us, it just doesn't make any sense, particularly when we have these reports that show toxic fluids are, sh are showing up in these injection activities, and the consequences of those toxic fluids are having uh, adverse circumstances inflicted upon innocent people. And we have a number of reports ourselves on that. So this is just something that we're trying to deal with in the context of the legislation that uh, Diane DeJet talked about a little while ago. Um, we uh, understand that uh, several of the witnesses claim that there is no evidence. Some people, a lot of people claim that there's no evidence that fracking has caused water contamination. But we have seen that there is water contamination in a number of places, and I mentioned those places before. Alabama, Arkansas, Colorado, Texas. I had a call yesterday from a man in Texas that uh, was talking about uh, the impact of these uh, toxic chemicals on his family and how it had contaminated his water supply. So I, I, uh, th that's why we're trying to deal with this issue. And I wanted to ask Mr. Appleton if you're aware of any of the independent empirical research that has been conducted that uh, in any way suggests that fracking does not pose a risk to water supplies. Is there any proof out there? Well, any time you put chemicals like are used in fracking into the environment, it's a risk to water supply if they're not properly regulated. There's also a problem that in states like New York, they don't require incidents uh, to be reported on a systematic basis, so you can't really determine this issue either way. For decades, the oil and gas industry has lobbied to create a regulatory climate which has paved the way for the current drilling boom. Back in 2000, after the Bush-Cheney election, there was a dramatic acceleration in drilling activity. Both had received large contributions from oil and gas interests, and the vice president had been the chief executive of Halliburton, a major player in the drilling industry. Meeting the needs of our growing economy also means expanding our domestic production of oil and natural gas, which are vital fuels for transportation, electricity, and manufacturing. Whatever our hopes for developing alternative sources and for conserving energy, and that's part of our plan, the reality is that fossil fuels supply virtually 100% of our transportation needs below. Many Democrats fought the Bush-Cheney energy policies. They felt they were shut out of the process of developing the nation's approach to energy. This administration is a gas and oil administration, frankly, and, and so they're, they're wedded to an old policy. They're wedded to a 20th century policy when we need a 21st century policy. You have the Bush administration, you have two oil men at the very top, and they aren't sympathetic. They're making very serious mistakes because they've talked to themselves and the energy companies and only themselves and the energy companies. We don't know what other provisions may have been added in, uh, special interest provisions that, that are easy to add in when you're writing one of these bills in secret. In 2005, the administration's energy bill passed with support from members of both political parties. It provided the gas and oil industry with billions of dollars in subsidies, tax breaks, and research money. 65% of the current subsidies go to gas and oil, and you have this imbalance. We ought to have 65% or more, 80%, ought to be going to alternative renewable technology, to energy efficiency. 
The energy bill makes practical reforms to the oil and gas permitting process to encourage new exploration. After years of debate and division, Congress passed a good bill. There she is. <laughs> we call it our new neighbor, neighbor 907. We have 70 acres here, and I can't convince them that they need to drill somewhere besides 200 feet from our house. The boom is happening all over the country. There's oil and gas operations in 32 states right now, but the Rocky Mountain states are really seeing the vast majority of the expansion. This will be the gate to enter into my property. The old company had me completely locked out. A split estate situation is when somebody who owns the surface of their land does not own the resources that are underneath their land. Whoever owns the surface probably can't control what happens on their own property. You feel so helpless, you know. My great-grandfather is buried here. They totally wiped out the cemetery. But we have a very large emphasis about being a good neighbor, about doing the things that you would do in your neighborhood with your next door neighbor. We were in bed actually sleeping, and then our son called. He said that the well was on fire. See all them bubbles in that water up there, Bob? Jesus, yeah. That's all gas coming up. Yeah, let's go ahead and light it. Oh, yeah, it burns. They don't tell you everything that's in a product. You may only get 5% of what's in that product, and the rest of it is proprietary, or they just don't give it. Every single fracking company, they sell that theirs is the best product. It would be like um, divulging why your chocolate is better than somebody else's chocolate, because you have those ingredients. It's actually believable that someone says toxic. That stuff in the pit is not hazardous and not toxic. I have fracking fluid taken right out of a fracking truck. I've had it in my mouth, I've tasted it, and I'm just fine. Well, around 50% of the chemicals cause such things as kidney damage, cardiovascular problems. This is before any problems in it, before we lived in Rifle. And then has everything changed? There's no question that people are getting sick from oil and gas exploration throughout the United States. And when you ask them what their symptoms are, it's the same in one area as it, it is in another area. Today, we have close to 5,000 wells that have been drilled. That's just in the northwestern area. And if you look down the road uh, 15 years and you start contemplating 60,000 wells, what does that do? The hills 
lungs are alive with the sound of music. 